As China's top political advisory body concludes its annual session this afternoon, it has made decisions on the most pressing issues, including public, national, and economic security. A draft decision to introduce national security legislation for the Hong Kong SAR is under deliberation at China's national legislature during its annual season. Will the legislation create a more law-based and stable business environment? Could Hong Kong maintain its status as a global financial hub? Will it help restore confidence? I talk with David Chu, a CPPCC member from Hong Kong. What do you make of the latest violence going on in the streets of Hong Kong as a result of the debate over the legislation? Well, it's obviously not welcomed by the majority of the people of Hong Kong. But the bad news is, I'm afraid that it will continue and it could even escalate it in the next two weeks. What do you then, David, make up the timing and the significance of this uh, legislation, despite of the fact that uh, Hong Kong is pretty much divided already, but this legislation, what does that mean for the security of Hong Kong? Well, obviously, I think the majority of the people in Hong Kong just want to return to their normal life. And therefore, I truly, for one, believe the quicker the legislative are passed, it will be better for Hong Kong as a whole. But how quick? Uh, there is a process, right? And also, there's also about the details about uh, how to implement it, who to implement it, under what circumstances to implement it, uh, within what time frame also. David? Well, legally, this is have to be implemented by Beijing. I'm afraid there is no definite answer can be given today. But I was told it could take up to three to four or even five months for the legislative procedure in China. But to us, for the people of Hong Kong, the quicker the better. What do you mean by the quicker the better? Why? Well, because, you know, if you, you, I'm sure you see already, there are riots in the street every day. You know, you know, I mean, they're beating up people on the street. You know, they're disturbing shopping center. They're disturbing MTR, the train station. The people want, you know, you know even the, the people normally driving the car in the street. So it's, 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 if only one comes to Hong Kong, they would realize they are truly disturbing and being a nuisance for everybody day-to-day -day life of Hong Kong. So therefore, it is only natural and it's understandable why Hong Kong people want to make it as soon as possible, that hopefully they can all go back to their normal life. Of course, David, as you may know, there are a lot of different opinions in the international media, to say the least. Meanwhile, some governments have threatened, or at least the representatives of certain governments, have threatened to uh, uh, slash sanctions either in Hong Kong or at China as a whole. So David, as one living and working now in Hong Kong, what do you make of these uh, uh, threats, different opinions, and also uh, certainly uh, harsh words? I think the threat is, is groundless, which Hong Kong is part of China, which country on earth will allow anybody to disturb the securities, the independent of their own countries. And, and frankly speaking, I was born in Hong Kong some many years ago. Hong Kong to the world are at its best as an economic centre. Hong Kong have never been a political centre. Hong Kong served the world best. We are the New York of the East. We are the financial centre, we're the tourist centre, you know, and we also the door opener for China, which benefit a lot of companies that go into China to invest and vice versa. So I think the world should appreciate the function of Hong Kong are at its best economically, not politically. But David, as you may know, over the past one year or so, when the street violence goes on in Hong Kong, some try to turn away their heads from the facts of the violence, only concentrating 
on the political division inside the region. Uh, what do you make of uh, practices like this? Meanwhile, um, will the implementation of this legislation further split Hong Kong? Uh, are you going to see uh, more uh, violence in the streets, uh, in a way? Well, the violence in the street is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. The fundamental of this national security law, frankly speaking, in my opinion, China have no choice, and Hong Kong also have not the luxury of time. The majority of the people of Hong Kong just want to go back to their normal day-to-day -day life. So, so basically, I sincerely believe the majority of the people in Hong Kong are very supportive. Now, you've already seen some try to shape it in an ideological way, David. Uh, for example, uh, suggesting that it is the communist China that is going to take away the freedom of Hong Kong, which Hong Kong should enjoy in one country, two systems. Uh, others suggest that now the two, one country, two system works well in Hong Kong, but after this legislation, that is gone. Uh, your thought? Honestly, I think China really has been very supportive of Hong Kong. China have always been very sincere and, and we all see in the last over 20 years one country and two system truly works. It works for Hong Kong, it works for China, it also works for the rest of the world. Uh, I just don't see this national security law implemented is only deal with very limited people. Unless you want to be a traitor of your country, unless you believe Chi Hong Kong should be independent, it doesn't affect the day-to-day -day life of the majority people of Hong Kong. So I don't think it ever disturb the principle of one country, two system. David, you run several media organizations yourself. Now, the media business is, uh, facing a lot of challenges, uh, whether it's economic challenges or political challenges, uh, not to mention the list is pandemic. How do you think uh, th the media has been covering Hong Kong? And how do you think media should cover uh, the latest events in Hong Kong and cover Hong Kong, which is you were born in and grew up in? I think on the two part of your questions, I think first is the world should appreciate that Hong Kong, by many organizations, not from China, not from Hong Kong, world-scale you know, organizations have always believed and give the ranking of Hong Kong one of the freest society in the world. And we have always enjoyed that. And therefore, the press in Hong Kong have also enjoyed so much freedom. I think the world should not take that for granted. As for the freedom of press in Hong Kong, me as the chairman of one of the television companies in Hong Kong, I agree. To some extent, there is too much freedom. I think a good media should only report the news, not to be too opinionated. There are a lot of media in Hong Kong because of the freedom of our society who become very opinionated and for the wrong reason. It doesn't serve its best. It doesn't help the prosperity of Hong Kong. And of course, as for your second passion, is that being a chairman of television of a company in Hong Kong, of the, one of the free television companies in Hong Kong, it's not easy. Television are not easy. We are facing a lot of competition. But that's not important. I think what is important that, you know, the world, if I may report, Pete, should appreciate and respect the freedom of Hong Kong that we have enjoyed. And we welcome everybody to come to Hong Kong because of its freedom. And therefore, we should, and the world should not take that for granted. Having said that, though, we also see some of the other media Mongol in Hong Kong have become political figures. I wouldn't mention name one by one. What do you make, uh, David, uh, with uh, 
the tools that they have in the media and also themselves become political figures. Well, I can't speak for others, but I think, frankly, at least me at my own company, that we, we just basically report news as news. And I, would, I don't think as a chairman of a media company of any kind should leverage it for its own purpose. On the other hand, David, uh, Hong Kong has been so much divided. The violence it has become the norm to a certain extent. So uh, the consensus building inside Hong Kong society become extremely difficult. That's reflected in the SRS work agenda over the past uh, one year and two. Uh, how much confidence do you think uh, the mainland, uh, or shall I say the central government in Beijing could still have about Hong Kong from your perspective? I think since 1997, Beijing and China have nothing but been helpful. They gave Hong Kong so many privilege, you know, they give Hong Kong so much support, the people of Hong Kong should not complain. And even we now do occasionally create some disturbance to China, to Beijing. The way I look at it, they continue wanting to support us. They continue believe in the one country, two system. And I think Hong Kong's been very lucky on that way. But Hong Kong on our own is not, is not we can't always blame it politically. If I may sidetrack a little bit, Hong Kong are not free of just political problem alone. Hong Kong has a lot of economic problem. For example, we all know Hong Kong property price is one of the highest in the world. So, you know, finding, affording your own house are a very difficult issue in Hong Kong. The, the difference between the richest and the poor are amongst the highest in the world. So it's Hong Kong has its own other economic social problem too. But then how to address these problems when you have political divisions, when any kinds of legislation for example, with the Legislative Council has become extremely difficult. When you have a policy, a blueprint of how to address the unprivileged and yet uh, hard to implement. Uh, so it, it, isn't that a dilemma in a way? Well, it is a dilemma because Hong Kong, since 1997, we have a unique political situation, as you can see, which is not easy to handle. Well, there's no at least I don't know the universal questions how to solve all our problems. All I can say, we are moving towards solutions step by step. And I think the national security net legislation with the support of China is definitely one thing I hope will soon bring back the normal life of the people of Hong Kong. What would you say to those who try to say, well, Hong Kong, if you go with what Chinese central government is saying, we're going to impose sanctions upon you, and you're going to lose the free trade status and some of the other privileges Hong Kong has been enjoying. Uh, what would you say to them? As I say, the national security you know, legislation is only very limited uh, it's to, to a few things. I mean, unless you aspire, unless you, you want to go for independent Hong Kong, unless you're ready to betray your own country. I don't think it truly affects the people of Hong Kong at all. I mean, the, on the contrary, I think the day-to-day -day life of Hong Kong people hopefully will be better once this legislation will be executed. You are a CPPCC member it's a member of China's top advisory body. So people might wonder about all the comments you just made, whether you are one of the benefiters of the current system, and whether you are enjoying your benefits while others in Hong Kong might not. Uh, what would you say, David? I, I don't think so. You know, you know, I think most people, whether I'm a CCPC or not, I think majority of the people in Hong Kong want stabilities. They want their life back to normal life. To you, what is freedom? Well, I think freedom is, is, is to me, is very basic. 
I'm a businessman, it's free to do trades, free to do whatever deal or transaction I want to do. I'm free to travel, you know, I'm choose to in and out of a country. What's Hong Kong freedom? People look at it that way. I mean, I know there are people who talk about one vote what individually, that's truly freedom. But in all fairness to Hong Kong, as I say, Hong Kong have always been the economic center. And even during the British time, we never have one person, one vote, number one. And secondly, three years ago, if you do remember, China did support a, a, a one vote, one person in our Hong Kong unique way. And it's the opposition party which turned it down.